What is up? Welcome back to the Be Unexpected podcast with Wyatt Spaulding and Jake Spurnside. Uh, today we have Mitch Sherman. Uh, Mitch Sherman works with The Athletic currently, spent time with the World Herald and ESPN. How are we doing, Mitch? I'm good, guys. How are you? We're doing well, doing well this morning. Uh, one day closer to a Husker game. Husker, well, next week they play. So, yeah. So, Mitch, you are from Omaha, correct? I am. Grew up in Omaha. Went to high school at Burke High School. Um, from there, went to Nebraska, um, University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Um, and after college, as you mentioned, first job was at the Omaha World Herald. Started that when I was still in school covering Nebraska football and in the uh, championship era of the of the 90s. And I spent more than more than a decade at the World Herald doing all kinds of Nebraska football, Nebraska sports, um, really everything with the athletic department was part of a team that covered the covered the Huskers and then went to ESPN in, in 2011 and spent eight years there doing all kinds of college sports, college football, basketball, um, college World Series, which was something I did um, in my time at the World Herald, too. And, and then in 2019. Um, I moved to switch to the athletic, uh, moved over to the athletic where I am now. And, and it's a great company, um, primarily cover Nebraska. So, um, kind of got me back to my roots a little bit with that, which was something that I wanted because, um, I've always lived in this, in this state and in this, these communities and, um, you know, the eight years at ESPN was awesome, but, um, you know, I, I really wanted to be closer to, um, you know, to what I, uh, what I lived on a daily basis as far as, uh, as, as how the, uh, the work, um, part of it meshed with that. So did you grow up a huge, going to Burke, a huge Husker fan, uh, playing sports or mm -hmm. was, what did you grow into being a Husker fan or what was that like? Well, yeah, I grew up a Husker fan. Um, you know, grew up in the eighties. So it was like the, um, you know, I remember my first memories of Nebraska football were the scoring explosion era um you know really uh, really uh, uh, right about that time in 1983 when nebraska had turner gill and mike rogier and irving fryer in that offense that put up you know 50 points a game um that was that those are some of my first memories of nebraska football i remember meeting turner gill as, as a little kid at a you know an appearance that he did in omaha probably after his senior year and you know, that that's that I, in fact, talked to Turner later about that, um, when, you know, when he was coaching in Nebraska and I was covering him, um, you know, a decade or, or, or more later. And, and you know, I think those stories are are pretty common among kids who grew up in Nebraska in that time. And 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 later, you know, of course, in the 90s, um, played sports. Yeah. Baseball, basketball, primarily, um, you know, a little bit in high school, but. Um, you know, that, that my, my sports playing career, uh, kind of fizzled out in high school because, you know, I was at a big class A school and, um, Burke was, was really good at both of those sports. So I looked for a way, you know, after that opportunity, um, was no longer there to, to compete at the, at that level to continue in sports. And, and I found it in, in sports writing. And I, I started with that while I was in high school and, you know, some reporting on those teams that, um, you know, won championships or played for championships in, in high school at Burke. And, and, you know, that was a, a, a small part of, of my experience then um, and just got a, a little taste in, in sports journalism. But as soon as I got to school in Lincoln and in, in college, um, I just exploded right away. And, and um, you know, I knew that it was something I wanted to do for a long time. Yeah. So you got to college in the late nineties. So you, did you go to those uh, national championship, national championship games and cover those? Yeah. So I started, I actually started in 93. I graduated from high school in 93. And so the fall of 93 was my first um, football season as a student reporter in Lincoln. And that was the start of uh, a run where four out of five years, Nebraska played for the national championship. And so I went to all of those games um, it, I, on various levels of, of, uh, you know, my perspective changed over the, over those five years that I was in school. It went from the, the first year 
I was a reporter at the at the student newspaper, the Daily Nebraska, in the, the 1993 season, and that's the year that Nebraska played Florida State, Charlie Ward in the in the Orange Bowl, and you know Trev Alberts was the the Butkus Award winner that year. So I covered Trev's last year of college, which you know turned out to be a fortunate thing, and 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 him being somebody that was good to know um, in the in the years ahead. You know that's that's benefited me. I you know Trev, Trev and I have had that conversation too about how. Um, I, I was, a, I was a freshman when he was a senior and, and I got to cover his last year of college. Pretty cool. That's um, awesome. Wow. But, wow. um, but yeah, so I went to that game, um, as a student more, more as a fan, um, mm-hmm. because, you know, we had, um, uh, some writers with more seniority than me who were in the press box covering that game, but the 94 game against Miami, um, I covered that. Um, the 95 game in, in Phoenix against Florida um, was there for that, working working at that one for sure. Um, in 96, Nebraska missed the national championship game um, because of that loss to Texas in the mm-hmm. Big 12 title game. Um, but, you know, still uh, was co- was covering that team. And in 97, um, that was the, the Scott Frost year, um, you know, Osborne's last season. And, you know, it's Peyton Manning in the Orange Bowl. And I was there for that one, working for the World Herald. So that was, that was uh, um, you know, I was about to graduate. And um, I, was, I was already working for the Omaha World Herald that, at that time in 97. So you covered uh, Nebraska football through college. And then when you came out of college, did you keep recovering, uh, covering Nebraska football? Or did you, like, have to, like yeah. – uh, did you ever cover any other sports like baseball or basketball, any of those things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when I, when I was hired by the world Herald, um, after, I, after in 98, when I graduated, you know, like I said, I worked for the, for the newspaper in, in 97 the football season while, while still working toward, toward my, uh, degree. And then as soon as I, as soon as I graduated, they brought me on full time. And the main assignment was to cover Nebraska football, you know, because that's, that's yeah. the big thing that people care about. That's where the reader interest is at. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was kind of the low man on the totem pole as far as like my experience or my, you know, my age. So, uh, you know, they threw me in on some other stuff too. everything from like um, dirt track, auto racing and Cornhusker state games to um, Nebraska wrestling, track and field gymnastics. Um, I spent one year um covering the the uh, the the men's basketball beat um when when paper was kind of in a transitional phase as far as who was who were who the long longer term beat writers were so that was like in the Barry Collier years in the early 2000s Mm. um so one season doing that and then would fill in occasionally other times on on uh on basketball but yeah I was the I, I covered baseball was the primary writer on Nebraska baseball during their their great run um, from 99 to 2005 when they, when they played in, in three college world series, um, you know, and, and, you know, I, I, that, I got to be really big during that time, as far as yeah. the interest that there was in Nebraska baseball in those years. So that was, that was almost, you know, not a quite on the level, but it was almost, I, I spent almost as much time or devoted almost, almost as much of my time during the course of a calendar year, um, on, on baseball in that period, as I did on football, and then, yeah, I mean, I covered a lot of Nebraska volleyball um, during that during those years too at the World Herald early in my time there. Um, women's basketball. There was um, the year that Nebraska women's basketball was a, a number one seed in the NCAA tournament with Kelsey Griffin. Kelsey and, Griffin. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah, that um, that team. Um, I stepped in and 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 covered that team um, toward toward the in the second half of the season. I think they were undefeated for you know, really deep into the, into the year, um, would have been 2010, like the, the winter and spring of 2010. Um, I know that because my, my son was born, um, later that year, we've got a daughter who's 16 and a son who's um, going to be 12 here, um, coming up and, and he was born later that year in 2010. I remember, um, you know, that I had covered the women's basketball beat er- early in that year, um, just for a few months, but got to travel with them to, uh, to Minneapolis and Kansas city for the first couple rounds of, uh, or for the, for the uh, round of 64, 32, and then the sweet 16, I think they lost in the sweet 16 that year. So that was, that was fun too, something different, but, uh, you know, 
um, by and large through the years, um, you know, football has, has taken up the, the majority of my, uh, my work hours. Wow. In the midst of that, it's crazy to think all the Husker coaches, all the relationships, mm-hmm. all the, that they've gone through, whether that's football, baseball, yeah. basketball. That college pretty- road series. Yeah, the Colorado Series experience probably had to be pretty cool because it's in Omaha, Nebraska mm-hmm. made it. It's probably impossible to get a ticket, mm-hmm. wasn't it? If you didn't have it in like you did. Yeah, right. I mean, I was. Uh, yeah, it was good. That was a time where it was good to have a press pass and have yeah. a reserve seat <laughs> in the press box for sure. And you know, I was, I was working, but it was still. I, I still got got swept up like you know everybody did, I think, and just like the. Um, you know, the gravity of that moment to have Nebraska in the College World Series, not just once, but three times in, in mm-hmm. 01, 02, and, and then 05. Yeah, it was um, it was a great experience, you know, um, and not just the College World Series uh, appearances in that time by Nebraska baseball, but all of the success that Nebraska baseball had in those years with, mm-hmm. um, you know, a, a number of four or five Big 12 tournament championships, a couple of Big 12 regular season championships um they played in in a super regional at stanford the year before the first college world series appearance and you know we're we're one game away from making it to omaha that year in 2000 and so i was out there for that and that was um that was great um, a great experience from my perspective you know to write about that and cover that and the next year um it beat um it beat uh Miami, uh, Miami came to Lincoln for the Super Regional in 2001, and that was the first year at at uh, at Haymarket Park um, Stadium had opened just the, the previous summer um, after the Nebraska season was over, and um, so they won a Super Regional. And um, actually, I think 05 was oh, oh, Miami was 05. Um, it was I'm sorry, it was Rice in 2001, and they beat Richmond in 2002, and in Miami in 05. So. Um, yeah, a long time ago. That was, that was more than 20 years, 20 years ago. But uh, yeah, those were all in, in the, the experience of going to Omaha, of, of those guys going to Omaha um, was amazing. It was amazing for the fans. Mm-hmm. You know, it was unfortunate for Nebraska that it didn't have more success. Those, those teams in, in, in Omaha, those mm-hmm. teams in 01 and 02, um, they, they both went 0-2. And, and then in, in 05, they won one game and then played an epic um, extra inning game against Arizona State um in the that in the winner's bracket that would have um you know really potentially springboarded them closer to national championship or at least you know on the on the doorstep of being able to play in the championship um in the championship round so yeah. um you know the fans the fans at that time you know that it was it was intense um mm-hmm. the the interest and the passion around nebraska baseball and you know you really saw it on display um at rosenblatt stadium in those three years that's awesome. In the midst of all of that, and you, one thing I, I've realized as a Husker fan, the support is always there. And even now with everything going on with the football program and the basketball program, it's crazy. And, that, and when a team makes the College Road Series, insane. Like if Nebraska volleyball makes the Final Four this year in Omaha, that's just going to be insane. So just the, the support of Nebraska athletics, it's just insane. Yeah, it's unique. Um, it's unique. You know, there's there's places around the country um, that are similar to, to Lincoln, Nebraska, as far as the, um, you know, the setup with 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 college sports that Nebraska has and, and that there's not a pro team in the state. There's not um, another major college team, at least in football um, in the state. You know, you do have competition with Creighton, of course, and in, in, in basketball and in volleyball. Um, so there's some split there uh, among the population with, with where their fan allegiances are, but Nebraska is, is, isn't, is, and always has been, you know, the big public school in the state. And that's, it's somewhat unique. You know, you go to um, a state like Alabama or, you know, Ohio or Michigan and, and you, you're, you're always going to have, or in all of those instances, you have another school, another big school mm-hmm. that plays football um, mm-hmm. and is, is on the same level with like the resources that the athletic department has. And in Nebraska, um, in the state of Nebraska, um, that just isn't the case. You know, Creighton is, is outstanding at what it does and does well, but it's, it's a smaller private school and um, obviously doesn't have a football team. So it's kind of apples and oranges. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Nebraska, you know, the, I think the fan support is, is a result of that in, in just that when it comes to football and it, it does, um, 
it does seep down to those other sports too. Um, it's just, it's, it's somewhat unrivaled, um, the kind of passion that you see and the loyalty that you see among Nebraska fans to continue to sell out Memorial Stadium, you know, after 60 years um, and to do it in a time when um, the team is struggling, you know, you, you, you see the same kind of passion and support for Nebraska volleyball and, you know, even in sports like, like baseball and, and basketball, um, there's tremendous support for, for Nebraska athletics. You know, it's just a, it's just a, um, a reflection, I think, of the people in Nebraska and their, um, you know, their interests, um, their, their dedication to, to sports and to that university. And, and, you know, it's fun to, to kind of be a part of that and, and, you know, watch it um, somewhat close to the inside. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, we've been doing good in volleyball. We're dominating in baseball. Mm-hmm. We won the conference a couple of times. But as a Nebraska fan growing up, and is it hard to sometimes write about the negativity that, you know, we haven't been doing good in football and basketball. We've been struggling. Is it hard sometimes to write? Like, you're just writing the facts. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we didn't play good in this game, and we got to do this and this to win. And, like, how does that affect you as – like a like a, just a fan of Nebraska because you're doing your job. You got to write the facts if they aren't playing well. So, sure. Well, I mean, you know, pretty early in my time as a as a um, sports writer, I had to set aside that that um, that fan um, attitude. And you know, I, th- I think that there's times where it would seem from the outside that that would be a difficult thing to do. It's like, yeah, I grew up wearing the big red colors and and cheering for Nebraska and, you know, relishing the opportunities that I had to be able to go to Memorial stadium or to go to the Bob Devaney sports center and, and, you know, see uh, Nebraska had some pretty good basketball teams. Like, you know, when I was a student or, you know, when I was in high school Um, and I remember, you know, being right there and and cheering for them as much as I did the football program. But, um, you know, I, I still, I still feel connected. I still feel like, obviously I'm a part, I'm a part of the community. I'm raising my kids, raising my family, um, in this community. And, you know, I'm invested in, in, you know, everything that happens in the state of Nebraska, but at the same time, um, you know, when it comes to work and what I write in the way that I report, um, you know, I've been doing this long enough where it is not a difficult thing to be able to set that apart. Um, it would serve me and my audience better. Yes. Nebraska was, was successful in the same way that it was <laughs> when I was growing up. I mean, more people would want to read, consume, consume the content, but you know, the reality is people are interested in, um, in the struggles that Nebraska right. has had too. And, you know, it's always that quest for Nebraska, or at least it has been in the last several years with football. It's always that quest, you know, to, to get back, close to the top to, to get back to a place um, where first they're competing for conference championships. And, and then, you know, maybe they can take it a step farther. And, and there's been so much change. There's been so much turnover, um, you know, with the head coaches, um, of course, with the, with the coaching staffs, you know, I've seen this similar kind of change with the athletic directors, you know, it's, it's dramatic. Um, it's interesting. So while it's not like the same kind of um, the the storylines are much different than when I grew up watching it. Uh, But, you know, fortunately for me in my job, the the passion and the interest is still there. There's still, I think, as much desire for Nebraska to be great among the people who follow the program as there was even when Nebraska was great. And so that's, you know, what matters most to me in being able to make a career out of this. Mm -hmm. Um, If, if when the the programs began to struggle, the interest waned too, um, then, you know, that would be problematic for me because I, I I wouldn't be able to, to write about it and, and record podcasts about it and, and, you know, talk on the radio um, about the kinds of things that I do with it, it. It just, it wouldn't be consumed in the same way. So, you know, and I'm, I'm eternally grateful to the Nebraska um, fan base, I guess, for um, that passion that they have, because it allows me to 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 have a career and to be able to do it here. I mean, I could go cover, um, you know, Big 12 football or, um, you know, something else and probably even still do it from this home base here in Omaha. But it's a lot more rewarding for me 
um, as I mentioned earlier, to be able to cover a team that um, ignites such passionate feelings from the people who live and work and and you know go to school and live their lives right here around me. So um, as long as there's interest, um, Wyatt, uh, you know that's the most important thing, and and yeah. fortunately that's that's uh, that's still there through all the years of ups and downs. Oh yeah, just like going back to what Jake said, the loyalty of Nebraska fans, you know, we always show up whether we're, you know, mm -hmm. ten and zero or three and six, you know, we're always going to be there. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, and I think there's a, I do think that there's a, you know, there's there's a, a tipping point for that, you know, mm -hmm. it just it can't go on mm -hmm. forever. I think Trev right. Alberts is as the athletic director is is very cognizant of that too, and that's why there's such urgency right now as Nebraska is going through this this coaching change again, uh, this transition, um, you know, the understanding is there from him and other leaders at the university that, you know, you can't continue to do this. You can't continue to put a coach in place um, who builds a team that doesn't reach the expectations mm -hmm. of the fans and expect that that support is going to continue year after year after year when the level of play on the field or the, the 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 finish in the standings in the conference or nationally um, isn't up to isn't up to par. So there is, you know, while Nebraska fans have been very patient mm -hmm. and they've endured a lot over the last two decades, um, it isn't the limit. Their patience isn't limitless. There 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 would yeah. come a time, I think, where you would see apathy set in and you would see things begin to crumble as far as the the support that Nebraska receives from its fans. And you know, on some level you see, you, you see signs of that, you know, you see kids today, um, you know, walking around wearing Iowa sweatshirts or, you know, a Texas sweatshirt or an Ohio yeah. state or, you know, Miami. And these are the kinds of things that, you, you know, when I grew up, you didn't see that. Um, it oh, was, yeah. it was extremely rare. Maybe if somebody was on vacation and they were visiting from out of town, but there, you know, there, there, there are signs that there are cracks in the armor and, you know, that's, that's why there's so much urgency, I think, um, part that's part of why there's so much urgency right now in making sure that this time when when Nebraska does make this change and, and make the decision that is in the works right now that that they they do it right that they hit a home run that they that they get this one right and they and they find somebody um, who's going to run a program that um, all Nebraska fans you know are proud to be able to go out and wear wear the wear those those red sweatshirts uh, to support. Yeah. yeah, Wyatt and I were just talking before you came on. We were remembering in 2017 when they had the uh, press conference for Scott Frost and all the former players come in and Bill Moose. And that just leads me to think, what what is next? Like, what does Nebraska do in regards to, like, what is Trav, what do you, what route do you think Trev Alberts is going to go? Bring someone in, keep Mickey, just your personal thought. Yeah, well, um, I mean, that's a process that he's been trying to figure out here yeah. over the last <laughs> yeah, six weeks and it's, con it's continuing to work on um, in the month ahead. I think it's good that he had, that Trev Alberts had the time um, that he did to work through this one because it's such a big decision. Mm. Um, you know, often times coaching searches are really rushed and you see, and, and we've seen it in Nebraska where a coach gets let go on Thanksgiving weekend and there's urgency, especially in this um, time that we're, we live in in college football now, where December is such a big month for players on the move. There's the early signing period. There's the transfer portal. Um, you know, there's all the considerations around name, image, and likeness. Um, you know, the last time that Nebraska changed coaches, you had some of those components involved. Um, and you also had a situation where it was very clear who Nebraska wanted as its next coach. So. Mm -hmm. Mike Riley is fired day after Thanksgiving or two days after Thanksgiving. And, you know, Scott Frost was on the, on the hook within a, a couple of days. Um, and, you know, that's what you, it, it didn't work. Look, it didn't work out um, for reasons that don't have anything, anything to do necessarily with the timing of the coaching transition that year. But um, that, that was one thing that did work out. They were able to find a coach quick and that's tough to do. Um, today it's tough to conduct a coaching search in a week um so trev has the luxury of being able to let this thing play out over a, no a number of months and i think he spent the first period 
of, of, of this search, um, you know, really researching and gathering intel about the Nebraska job and about what people thought of the Nebraska job. I think he talked to a lot of people who were not ever going to be candidates for the Nebraska job. And, you know, some of that got people excited. You know, they saw that Trev was talking to Urban Meyer when he was here for the <laughs> Oklahoma game in September. And it's like, oh, Urban Meyer should be the coach. Well, it's like, you know, if you sit back and look at it, Urban Meyer probably shouldn't be the coach at Nebraska, probably not at the right place in his career for what Nebraska needs. I understand he won a lot of games, but you know, we're not going to make this a podcast about urban Meyer. That's, that's, that's a, that could be a different one. Um, He was one of the people that Trev Alberts talked to um, just to gauge uh, opinions and perspective on what this Nebraska job is and what it can be. Um, And, you know, he's through that process now. I think he's now onto the stage where he's really heavy into vetting candidates and, and talking to, um, representatives for candidates, you know, back channeling, if, if um, you want to call it that. And, and then, you know, the next phase is going to be negotiations and, um, you know, and interviews and, um, and, and him actually sitting down with the coaches, you know, that, that, that he, that he covets. Um, it's difficult to do while the season is still going on. Um, it would, it, it's likely that, that most, if not all of the, the coaches he's looking at are, are with their teams right now. You know, there's been some coaches fired at the NFL level, or at least, you know, Matt Rule has been fired at the NFL level. So that's an exception where if he wanted to talk, um, you know, they could have that conversation now. But most of these guys are head coaches or, or maybe coordinators of um, big time college programs right now. And, and it's not in their best interest or, or not something that they want to do to go and talk to, to an athletic director at another school. So um, you know, these things happen, they happen slowly, deliberately, um, and there will be a time uh, when we get into November where some of those conversations are just going to have to happen, or those coaches, you know, aren't going to remain a part of this process. But, um, you know, Mickey Joseph's role in this is is interesting. Um, as you guys mentioned, um, you know, he's he's in charge of, of trying to put Nebraska in a better position um, than it was when he found it. Um, and that's awfully tough to do. When you know you're not able to uh, really sell the program for what's to come in the future, um, you know I think he's done a, a commendable job, an outstanding job in keeping things together in recruiting. That's a big part of what this interim staff is tasked with because um, you don't want to lose an entire recruiting class. You're going to be bringing in a new coach when there's a short amount of time ahead of the early signing period. You know that they're going to the, the new coach is going to want to keep as much of the talent. Um, that's currently on the roster, um, you know, intact. Um, and those are all big, big, important things, important, uh, um, objectives that, that Mickey Joseph is, 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 is helping tackle right now in his time as the interim coach. Um, you know, he's also, uh, potentially a candidate for the job full time. Uh, you know, I, I, I I'm, I'm not expecting that, that he's going to be the next coach in Nebraska. I know there's a lot of support for, for Mickey, that, uh, you know, people, um, you know, love the story right now of him as the former quarterback uh, leading this program. And, you know, it's it's a feel good situation. Um, certainly it was when he when he won a couple of games after taking over, um, you know, but it's it's also important to remember all of the difficulties that Nebraska has been through and is going through right now. And, you know, an objective for Trev Alberts here in this situation is to find somebody with the experience who has rebuilt these things before. And, you know, I think there's a place, um, there should absolutely be a place for Mickey Joseph um, at Nebraska in 2023. I think he's more than proven his value and it would be a mistake uh, for the next coach to let him go. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's really um, an, outside, uh, an outside shot, an unlikely possibility that he's going to be the guy who's, who's leading the program next year. Yeah. I mean, you definitely see some change with Mickey. We played like the Indiana game. I thought we played really good defense and then we beat Rutgers in a close game, but uh, it'll be, hopefully I just hope Mickey can get them to six wins and we can make a bowl. Do you think if we would make a bowl game that would make Mickey's chances stronger that he would get the job? Yeah, I mean, you know, it would, it would make the decision really interesting for Trev Alberts because if, if Mickey's able to get them to a bowl, that means six wins. You know, at this point, that means three more wins. Mm-hmm. Um, it likely means beating 
um, Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, um, you know, or some combination. I think Nebraska is not going to beat Michigan. I mean, <laughs> no. it's just, let's be real, no. be real yeah. about it. No. <laughs> um, so the only other game on the schedule uh, is Illinois. So went to win three or four against Illinois, Wisconsin, um, Iowa, um, and Minnesota uh, is, is uh, you know, it's possible. And, you know, I think it would, it would show, it would show something. It would show a lot with what Mickey Joseph has done. And, you know, if he's able to get to that point, then yeah, he deserves consideration. He deserves consideration. Now he Mm -hmm. deserves consideration just for who he is um, for the way that he's taken this thing over. And, um, you know, he's, he's, he's working on like such a multi faceted level, you know, he's got issues that he's had to deal with within the team. Um, to get these guys to believe, to get them in the right frame of mind, to be able to go out and believe that they're going to win games. Um, and he's also done a lot of work, which you know really is going above and beyond because it's not something that you normally see from what's considered to be a lame duck staff. But he, he's also done a lot of work um, in repairing relationships on the recruiting front. Um, this is a story that, that I wrote just this week um, and just published today um, as we talked. Um, about the job that Mickey Joseph has done in, in, in fixing some issues that existed for Nebraska and recruiting its own state, you know, which is, you know, almost unfathomable to think, you know, if there's one thing that you got, you have to do well as a head coach, it's you, you, you have to have good relationships with, um, well, there's many things that you have to do well as a head coach. So I'm oversimplifying it there. But one of the things that you must do well as a head coach in building your roster and acquiring talent um, in Nebraska or any state is to have good relationships and to have excellent lines of open communication um, with the high school prospects and coaches right in your backyard. Because even in a state like Nebraska, where the um, the talent and the ability to feed a power five program is limited because of the population size, um, it still serves as the foundation for, um, you know, for success. Uh, you look at the teams that have won championships and competed for championships, and even just the teams that have won eight, nine, ten games in a season at Nebraska, which is something that you know there's, that's 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 what, something they're striving to get back to before they can think about championships. Those teams, at the core of those teams, have sat um, you know the kids who who graduated from Nebraska high schools who who understood um, you know what it meant to represent the the university in Lincoln, um, who play with a ton of pride. Um, and, and who instill that in the all important, you know, talented players that come from out of state. You can't build um, a roster at Nebraska and win in the Big Ten around just the players who live in the state of Nebraska. Mm-hmm. But you can build the foundation um, for those teams and you need to build the foundation for those teams, because if you don't, um, they're going to go and play at uh, Wisconsin and Iowa and Oklahoma and, and they're going to they're going to come and beat you which is doubly painful. It's not just that you're getting beat by schools that are your rivals. It's that you're getting beat by your rivals with players that should be in your program that could be in your program. If, if you as, as a leader at Nebraska had done a better job of locking that down. So, um, you know, it's, it's alarming. I would say that Mickey had um, the amount of damage to repair within um, the local ranks around Omaha and Lincoln and, and, you know, mainly Omaha and Lincoln um, in the state of Nebraska. They hadn't lost players um, from the smaller communities yet, um, but that certainly I think would have come if, if some of the problems were allowed to, um, to continue. So not only has he been working with, working with um, the program on a ground level um, place to, you know, to fix issues in the locker room, he's also done, um, a commendable job in getting out and fixing some relationships and fixing some situations mm-hmm. um, in recruiting close to home. It's more difficult to do it farther from home right now, honestly, in this period for Mickey Joseph. Yeah, he's gone to Louisiana, his own home state, and done some recruiting. Um, but, if, you know, if you're going to Texas, if you're going to Florida, if you're going to Georgia right now and trying to recruit as the interim coach at Nebraska, and you can't tell those kids anything about um, who the head coach is going to be that they're going to play for, or what the system offensively or defensively is going to be that they're, that they're going to run. Um, it's unrealistic to expect that you're going to get those guys to want to come and, and sign up um, until mm-hmm. they know the answers to those questions. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, you've got to, you have to try to maintain 
um, with players that you've been recruiting in those areas far away from home. You've got you, you have to try to um, hold on to um, the commitments of players in state and out of state who have already decided that Nebraska is the place for them or that and, and that can change mm-hmm. uh, before they sign. And then really the place where you can make ground is close to home um, because that's the most likely um, those are the most likely schools, the most likely prospects that you're going to be able to find who want to come to Nebraska to play for Nebraska. Um, yeah. Not, not for a head coach, um, not because the school runs the offense or the defense that they like, but because, um, you know, they've got love and passion for the university of Nebraska. Mm-hmm. Um, those players exist close to home. And, you know, I think it's, it's smart um, and really strategic that, that Mickey and, you know, is, as the interim coach has, has spent the time that he has um, uh, focused when it comes to recruiting on, on that, on, on that, you know, area uh, close to, close to Lincoln. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, that all goes into, into um, I think Trev's consideration of mm-hmm. the job that Mickey's done and, you know, we'll see, I, I say all that. And then, and then I'll say in the same, in the same answer that I, I, I think, um, he's going to pick, Trev's going to pick a coach who, who has, you know, who has years of experience mm-hmm. right. in, yeah. in the, right. in the role of head coach. And, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's absolutely a place, there needs to be a place, um, for Mickey Joseph to, uh, to contribute to that and to be a valuable member of the staff. If that's something that he chooses that he wants to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think everyone in the state of Nebraska is a leaf. If it's not Mickey, have him around because what a great job he's been doing. I mean, I can only imagine what it's like recruiting and mm-hmm. there's a chance you, I, I just, how do you pitch it to the kids? I'm not going to be mm-hmm. here. A lot of staff might not be here, still come here and he still loves Nebraska a yeah. lot to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, yeah, going to back to some of your, I had a question through your time at the world Herald and ESPN. Is there one, person that you met that was like wow that was really cool and one story that you just that you wrote that you loved um well I mean there's a lot of people I met along the way you know there were people professionally um in in my business you know there are a lot of people I looked up to at the World Herald you know I was young when I when I started there so there were there were reporters that I worked with and I don't know if you mean if you mean like interview subjects like athletes or coaches that I met or or, you know, people who, who did the same job as me. And it was both, honestly, yeah. like, you know, it was great to, to be around um, Tom Osborne in mm-hmm. the final five years of, of his coaching uh, run. And, and then, you know, to, to make, to maintain that, that connection with him, that relationship with him, I mean, it, or not the same kind of relationship that, you know, his, his players or assistant coaches obviously, obviously had with him, but um, you know, I had a great amount of respect mm-hmm. or continue to have a great amount of respect for the job that he did as, as a coach and an administrator at Nebraska. And, and, you know, to be able to call him on something through the years after he retired um, and, you know, get on the phone or with him and, and, you know, get his, get him to weigh in on a story that I was writing. That was really valuable. So, you know, I would start there because mm-hmm. he was the guy who was coaching the team that I was covering at mm-hmm. the very beginning. Yeah. Um, you know, as far as the people that I worked alongside, yeah, like I mentioned, there were a ton of them at the World Herald. Um, you know, uh, I worked with Steve Pivovar on the Nebraska football beat at the at the very beginning of my time at the paper, and and you know, learned a lot from him about, about um, just how to how to do my job. And you know, he he passed away um, six years ago, and it was a great loss for um, for the community here and for sports and in Omaha and in the state of Nebraska. He spent the majority of, of his time. Um, covering Creighton and mm-hmm. was kind of the the the, the chief um, reporter for mm-hmm. the College World Series for for decades. So I looked up to him and and reporters like Lee Barfnecht, um, you know, who's retired now, but covered Nebraska and college football um, and college basketball for for decades at the paper. Um, you know, one of the great things about about being around Nebraska in the in the years that I was, especially early on, was that they drew so much national interest. And so you have people in the media, you know, in, in, in print and in broadcast who came in from all the big national outlets, you know, um, from New York and Chicago and and from, you know, anywhere and everywhere. 
as far as media coverage went. And, um, you know, some of those people I just kind of observed from afar and others, you know, I got to know and spent time around. And then, you know, some of them I worked um, with at ESPN or with the, or at the athletic. Now we've got a big, a big staff of, of, um, of writers and, and, you know, people who cover the sport. So um, there's definitely a camaraderie there among, among the media. And for me, that started, you know, really on day one, because I was, I was, uh, you know, working with great people, even in college, you know, a number of the people that I worked with in college, um, writing and editing with, um, you know, went on to have careers like I did in, in sports media. Um, it's just, it's just a long list. There, there, mm -hmm. there aren't a whole a lot of people other than the ones that I mentioned who necessarily stand out as, as like having, having guided me. Um, you know, one, one story I'll relate, um, when I was at the World Herald, um, yeah, um, this this was back in like 2007. So I had covered Nebraska baseball, um, like I mentioned, in the early part of the decade. And, and Alex Gordon um, was a was a you know a big a big uh, figure in Nebraska baseball in that time. And he went um, into the, into the MLB draft and mm -hmm. was the number two pick in the draft in 2005 that last time most recent time the third time that nebraska made the college world series he was the star of that team and he went to the kansas city royals um and you know worked his way up in a couple seasons through the minors and and i had covered alex all through his college career and you know stuck with covering him um, because he was from lincoln and he was of interest in nebraska people as a as a nebraska former nebraska player so i kept covering him 06 07 I went to spring training in Arizona and he was set to be a rookie um, and make his big league debut that April. And I was writing about that, that process and, you know, just what, what Alex was going through then. And, um, you know, there were a lot of comparisons at the time because he was a third baseman for the Kansas city Royals to George Brett, who, you know, is a generation older, um, but was kind of like my own personal, um, sports hero when I grew up, um, I was, I was a, a Royals fan, you know, in addition to following Nebraska, that was as a kid and, and, you know, the, the Royals part of it still, still today still holds true. Um, the, the, the team that, the, you know, the one team that's kind of a guilty pleasure that I've followed and, and remained a fan of. So, um, when I was reporting on, on Alex in spring training in, in 07, I got the chance to interview George Brett and to meet him and spend a little bit of time with him um, in spring training that year um, on the field um, you know, after a after a workout one day. Um, you know, talk about Alex, of course, but uh, yeah, it was really fun. It was it was it was um, a thrill for me as a just as a sports mm -hmm. fan. Um, you know, for, where those two worlds kind of came together in a rare moment for me, like sports fan and sports writer. Usually, you try to keep those separate, as I as I talked about earlier with Nebraska. Um, yeah. But in this case, you know, it wasn't like I was going to be covering the Royals all year. So, you know, I, 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 I let it, I let, I let those two things come together mm -hmm. and, and um, meeting him was, was a highlight for me of, of, um, you know, my whole career um, later on um, when I was in this current job at the athletic, um, when the pandemic in 2020 started and sports shut down, um, you know, we had to get really creative with the, uh, the content that we produced, we yeah. no longer had games to cover for, for several months. And even the normal storylines that existed in the off season for sports, um, you know, didn't really exist mm -hmm. for a short period of time in 2020 until things kicked up again. So um, we started to do a series about, um, I think it was called like my sports hero. And mm -hmm. they wanted us to, as writers to write about um people that we looked up to in sports. And so I, I, I looked back on that story that I wrote in 07 about uh, Gordon, but particularly the, the Brett, the George Brett involvement. And mm -hmm. I was able to, to use a resource that I had at the athletic, um, you know, we cover major league baseball and, you know, every, every big sport and um, got a phone number for George Brett and I reached out to him and told him that I wanted to interview him about this, not, you know, about, about how I talked to him 15 years before, 13 years before. And, you know, this time when we talked, I got him on the phone 
And this time when we talked, um, we talked more on, from a, on a personal level about how I looked up to him as a kid and the impact that he had on me um, to to play sports and to love sports. Um, and you know, it was really it was even more rewarding that second time I interviewed him to talk to him, not about, you know, another player over here, but about him and his career. And we talked about me and how it impacted me. And so I wrote a piece about that, which was, you know, one of the more enjoyable, um, you know, totally different than, you know, covering a, covering a football game or a baseball game, but definitely one of the more enjoyable, um, just like thrilling things that I got to do in, in my career, you know, obviously covering like national championship games, mm -hmm. um, you know, like the elite eight when it came to Omaha um, and Kansas played mm -hmm. Duke yeah, downtown here. That was, that was great. Oh, yeah. um but uh um but yeah like having those personal interactions like i did in, in that in that and what i just talked about there that that's you know that's something that i'll always remember it'll be a highlight for me mm. yeah that's really cool you gotta share that with one of your sports heroes because i think mm -hmm. sometimes athletes they don't really know like you make a huge mm -hmm. impact on just some random fan that thousands yep. of miles away so mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, he had that impact on tons of kids in the Midwest um, and really around the country just because of the way that um, his career went and the kind of player that he was um, and how hard he played. And that's what I looked up to about him, which is like how every time he was on the baseball diamond, it was like 120 percent. I mean, mm -hmm. never, never, never jogging, never going slow. And of course, he was a great player. But so, you know, other people, other people um, looked up to him in the same way. And we talked some about how he meets people all the time. Um, you know, whether it's in Kansas City or wherever he's at in the around the country um, representing baseball, he meets people who, you know, saw him in the same way that I did as a as a as a kid. And, and that's, you know, that's a it was a said it was a humbling experience for him and not not something that he ever really recognized when he was playing the game. But now, you know, he's 60 some years old. It's mm -hmm. it's um, it's it was it's interesting for him or it's rewarding for him to, to look back at that. And it, and it was and it was it was great for me. Um, to be able to be one of the people who like let him know the impact that he had on on me and other people as I grew up watching sports. Oh, great! That's great, man. Um, one last question before we go, guys. Um, so, how do you guys think we're going to do against Illinois next week? <laughs> you really want me to tell you? Tell us the truth. Yeah, we have the truth. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't think it's going to go great for Nebraska, guys. Um, okay. You know, like we got to be, we got to be real here. Um, yeah. And, and I think Nebraska has a better chance to get bowl eligible by beating Minnesota the week after, and then Wisconsin a couple weeks after that, and Iowa on Black mm. Friday. Oh yeah. I don't think that's I don't think that possibility is out the window. It can happen. Mm. Um, those teams are not vintage. Um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa this year. We've seen all of them have struggles. Right. The problem is they all play good defense. Mm -hmm. And yeah. maybe with the exception of Iowa, we haven't seen Iowa play any offense this year. But the other two have great running backs. Well, Illinois, who's coming into Lincoln next week, plays mm -hmm. great defense and has a great running back in mm -hmm. Chase Brown, who leads the country in rushing right now and you know is starting to emerge – as a, even a Heisman candidate, um, mm -hmm. you know, you're looking at potentially a first team, all big 10 back, you know, we've seen how Nebraska has defended the run this year through seven games. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you guys saw Purdue and Devin Mockaby, who's a walk on mm -hmm. um, put up almost 200 yards against Nebraska. So it yeah. could, it could be rough against mm -hmm. Illinois. Like they're the kind of team that, that if you're, if, if you're looking for a team that matches up well, against Nebraska in, in the state of what the Huskers are right now, um, it's Illinois. So it's going to take, um, it's going to take, a, and, and I'm not, and I'm not making, mm. I don't want to make Illinois out to be um, Georgia. Um, right. That's, that's not what they are, but they're a very, very good team and they're fundamental and they run the ball and they play mm -hmm. great defense. And I don't think that equates to a win for Nebraska. I just, I just don't, um, you know, Michigan is Illinois, but on a, on like on a, on a level where everything that's good about Illinois is even better about Michigan. So those yeah. two games for me, um, I'm putting them down in the loss column. Mm -hmm. 
okay. which means they've got to win the other three in order to get to six mm -hmm. and six. So uh, very little margin for error. Um, yeah. If if they can find a way um, against Illinois, I mean, it's certainly not um, un un imaginable um but uh, if they can find a way then you know i guess uh they'll prove me wrong and you know hey this the uh uh the race is on to get to to get to six wins because i think i really do think that's the threshold where you have to start to look at this whole season and mickey joseph's candidacy um entirely on a different level mm -hmm. um that would be an incredible accomplishment for him with this team to get them to to that point and if he, and if he does that um you know it's going to make like i said it's going to make things really interesting for trev alberts yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, Mitch, is this picture on your fridge? You and Matt Barry on Sports Center? Yeah, where did you find that picture? I I uh, I typed Mitch Sherman on Google yeah. and that's what came up. That's when the year the yeah. Iowa went undefeated. Yeah, right? I have that. I have it's, yeah, I'll tell you I'll tell you about that. So, I had that picture. A picture was very familiar when you when you when you held it up there, Jake. Um I had that um as a like i took somebody somebody took a screenshot of it and sent it to me and i had it like in my in my saved photos or like in my yeah. favorite photos for a long time i haven't seen it in a while but um but yeah i know exactly when when and where mm -hmm. and how that um that came about so that was from from 2015 correct okay. um, yeah 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 and iowa um went 12 and 0 that year in the regular season and um, played Michigan State in the Big Ten Championship and lost and then went to the Rose Bowl mm -hmm. and played Stanford and Christian McCaffrey. So I was at ESPN. The middle of my time at ESPN was covering the Big Ten. And I was on the Iowa train that year. Oh, um, okay. ESPN, ESPN said, I mean, that was the first year for Mike Riley at Nebraska. Mm. Um, you know, it was a losing season. Well, I think Nebraska went six and seven that season. Um, but uh, yeah, so a losing season. Mm -hmm. And um I didn't write a lot about Nebraska that year. I didn't write a ton about Nebraska in my eight years at ESPN. Um, but in 15, I, as soon as Iowa started to take off and it's CJ Beathard is the quarterback, he had a great mm -hmm. year. Um, I was driving to Iowa city um, sometimes twice a week, like on a Tuesday for the Kirk Ferentz press conferences. And then I'd get on Saturday to see them play. You know, they were, a, they were a college football playoff contender mm -hmm. yeah. that year. Yeah. So um, so at ESPN, you know, where college football playoff, like sits way at the top of the area of interest, you know, as it does for anywhere that covers college sports, you know, Iowa was, Iowa was at top of mind for a good chunk of that season. So I spent most of the 2015 season on the Iowa beat and covered the Rose bowl, um, that year went to Pasadena and, and it was, the, it was just the second Rose bowl that I've, I've covered in, in my career. Um, so that, that was memorable. But that interview right there on Sports Center was done in the Husker Vision Studios in Lincoln at Memorial Stadium on the morning after Iowa beat Nebraska to finish 12 and 0. And I think Nebraska wow. was trying to get Nebraska was trying to get a sixth win, and Iowa was trying to have a perfect season. And they played in Lincoln, and I covered the game. And ESPN wanted me on Sports Center to talk about the Hawkeyes the next morning on Saturday. And so I, I had Nebraska um, help me out and they've got a studio in the stadium mm. that can, that can talk back to Bristol, Connecticut, where sports center was being ah. taped. Oh, cool. So yeah, I went in, wow. I went in that's cool. In chair, they put me in the chair. We get, yeah. we got the, I, I, I came yeah. in wearing a suit <laughs> and um, yeah, we did it. And it looked, it looked like real, it looked professional. It looked like I yeah. was there, uh, you know, in, in a, in an ESPN studio, but in actuality, I was, uh, I was, I was yeah. sitting in the Husker vision studios at Memorial stadium oh. talking to uh, Matt Barry about Iowa's 12 and 0 run and, and whether the Hawkeyes were a, were a national championship. contender. Yeah. And, and was that game, was that game close to that Nebraska Iowa game? I think it was. Yeah. I thought all so. Those, you know, all of those games in 15, that was Riley's first season. Mm. Um, you know, they lost that year to start with on the, on the, the hail Mary against BYU. Mm. Yeah. Yep. And, Gosh, and then, and man. then almost all of the games that year, there might've been one that got out of hand, but mm -hmm. all of the games were close mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. Iowa wasn't blowing people out in typical no. Iowa fashion. Um, you know, they were, they were slug it, having slug slug fests with people. And they had a pretty good offense that year. Like I said, with Beathard and some good skill talent, um, and obviously a good defense and good special teams. That's why they went 12 and zero. um, but yeah, that, that was not, that was not, um, that was not a, a blowout at all by all yeah. by any means. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, Hey Mitch, thanks for joining us on the Be Unexpected podcast with Wyatt and Jake. We 
appreciate all your stories, your insight on Husker football and hopefully a Husker bowl game this year. Maybe who knows? I don't know. We'll see. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. Cross thanks, Mitch. Yeah. All right. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Thanks. Well, why that was a really cool interview with Mitch Sherman from the athletic, a uh, lot of years of experience with the world Herald uh, ESPN and now uh, working with the athletic and, it was really cool to hear him talk about where he started from the being Omaha Burke high school journalism writer to going to UNL to the World Herald to ESPN and just kind of cool all the relationships that he's built. Uh, it was really awesome him talking about how he got to know Coach Osborne in the 90s and then he over the years he kind of called him for some insight and kind of just build a relationship with him. So that was some cool things and uh, all the relationships that he built over the years. I'm sure that yeah. was awesome. It was cool to see like how he was there when we were really good in the nineties. And then like 2000, early 2000, 2010, we were like always like nine and three or eight and four. So we we're still good, but not like the powerhouse. And now we've kind of honestly been at the bottom with losing seasons. So just seeing the whole kind of program, change from different I guess you say like cycles mm -hmm. and like you know nothing lasts forever like you said like like we didn't we weren't powerhouses forever and we're not going to be three and six forever but and also okay. like the fan base like you know you and I we're so diehard Nebraska yeah. fans but he's seen like you know the fan base is kind of losing interest a little bit because we're not you know making bowl games and stuff and you know he has all this insight to him and it's not that you know, we, people don't love Nebraska football, but they want them to win. And just like yeah. his take on like the coaching, like who he thinks will be hired as a coach or what do you think the process, I should say, should, mm -hmm. is going to be. That yeah. was really interesting to me. So, yeah. Yeah. It sounds like he just really trusts whatever Trev Alberts decides to do. And everyone kind of is pulling for Mickey, but we'll kind of, I guess we'll see what, uh, see what decision they make. So, yeah. Well, thank you guys for listening to the Be Unexpected podcast with Wyatt Spaulding and Jake Burnside. If you'd like to ask for interview or someone that we should interview, uh, please email us at beunexpected100 at gmail.com. Thank you. See you.